welcome to the Do-It-Yourself Rescue Horse Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Cooper, and I am really excited to start this journey with you. Basically, my goal is to equip others who want to rescue horses to be able to do it uh, with help from me and this podcast. I am by no means an expert at all. Um, In fact, one of my mottos is I learn the hard way so that you don't have to. I tell that to my lesson students all the time, and it's very true. I definitely learned the hard way, but I think there's something really valuable in that. Um, Maybe it just means that I'm stubborn. I don't know, but anyway, I got into rescuing horses kind of by accident, actually, And I'll elaborate more on what the word rescue really means in a later podcast episode. Anyway, I got into it by way of accident. Um, Basically, it was back in 2008. I don't know if you guys would remember, but the economy wasn't really that great. And we had already had three horses Um, We got a fourth from my mom because our first horse was getting older and uh, my best friend had been riding him, which was super awesome. But my mom wanted her own horse, so we got this horse for free kind of by way through a friend and he was great and, um, you know, he was an off-the-track standard bred, but he, uh, he trotted, so he didn't pace, which was nice. We had a pacer. My sister had her own pacer. Um, which was different for us, but it was exactly what she needed at the time. But this horse for my mom worked out really well. We took him on trails. He was great, but we just, we couldn't really afford to have him. So we thought we would rehome him. We sold him to a guy who was going to be getting him for his girlfriend as a trail horse. They came out, I think, twice, although they didn't ever actually ride him, which is a red flag. Um, I'll talk more about that also in a later podcast episode. But anyway, so they picked him up and that was that, right? Well, luckily, this horse had a tattoo on his neck and was recognizable by our vet. Very good, right? Well, we found out that he ended up at an auction because the guy we, you know, rehomed him to, I forget if we gave him away for free. I doubt it. I'm sure he paid a few hundred dollars for this horse, but um, be very careful if you ever give a horse away for free because that's, you want someone to pay something for the horse because this could happen to you. Um, anyway, so he paid a very minimal amount and later took the horse, like two weeks later, took the horse to the auction to make a quick buck. Well, back then everyone was dumping their horses at the auction because they couldn't afford them. So horse prices were low, but no one was buying. And so what tends to happen is At this specific auction, the owner will bid on the horse, the owner of the auction, that is, and put the horse into the number 10 pen, which means this pen is specific to no one wants to buy this horse. I will just sell the horse for meat, basically. Um, And that's where you kind of get the term for kill pen. So this horse that we rehomed ended up in the number 10 pen. Now, luckily, our vet works with a local rescue organization who at the time was very involved with this exact auction. And he was out there looking at another horse for this rescue and he recognized the tattoo on this horse. Right away, he knew that this was our horse that we had just recently rehomed. Not good. (laughs) Um, We were pretty upset when we found out that that's what had happened to him, that we had gotten taken advantage of, and that this poor horse, who we thought was going to be a trail horse, ended up going to the auction and into the number 10 pen. So... 
yeah, that was pretty much a wake up call for us. We didn't even really know much about auctions at all. We had only ever gotten horses by way of, you know, you go online or you know someone and you pay a couple thousand dollars. And we had this process we would go through. We would go out to see the horse first. Then we would bring our trainer the next time. And then the third time we would do a vet evaluation on the horse. We spent a lot of time and money in choosing our horses because we were still pretty new at it um, at that point. And that's what I recommend to anyone who is just going to be buying a horse. You really, it's a huge investment and you really want to make sure it's a good fit. And your trainer will see something that you don't see and your vet will see stuff that you and your trainers don't see. So it's a very good method. However, it's, you'll see it's different when you go to the auction. You don't really have that opportunity. Anyway, back to my story. (laughs) So... We were pretty upset about this horse ending up in the number 10 pen. Luckily, that rescue organization did, in fact, pull him, and he ended up going to a lady out in Pennsylvania, which was cool. She was taking care of him until we could kind of figure out where he could go. We still couldn't really afford to keep him but we definitely wanted to make sure that he was pulled and had a safe landing. So this lady took him for us, and then eventually our friend just up the road ended up uh, adopting him, and he's still there, which is awesome, and we're so thankful for that. But how did we get more involved with the auctions? Well, we were pretty upset that this had happened to us. We were we had had horses, <clears throat> excuse me, we had had horses drugged, when we were trying to buy them by our first method of purchasing a horse, the three-step process that we used to use, and we still would have horses drugged. I have a funny story about that. Anyway, (laughs) for a later time, we were really upset that this had happened to us. I don't know if it was just us being naive or what, but we were like, we're going to go to this auction for the next one because they had one every week and we were going to see this guy and we were going to give him a piece of our mind. Well, (laughs) we did go back to the auction and that guy wasn't there, of course. So, you know, but the auction kind of intrigued us and we were like, huh, this is really interesting. This is a part of the horse world that we never really thought of. And we really felt bad for a lot of the horses that ended up there. I mean, there's lots of reasons why horses will end up there, but um, we just, we felt really bad. And of course, we wanted to take them all home, but again, uh, we really were trying to, well, at least my parents at this point, because my it was my parents' farm and my parents were the ones paying for everything. I was in high school. My parents were trying to trim back, you know, my sister and I were going to be going off to college soon, so it's not like we could really afford to really, you know, take on another horse, so that's why we rehomed our first horse. Well, that didn't last very long. <laughs> um, and you'll, yeah, you'll, soon, you'll soon hear all about there's this one very special horse that I ended up getting, Eventually, I want to say, I have to look back at the timeline, but we rehomed the horse over the summer and by November I had pulled my own horse who I have to this day um, as a yearling. And it's interesting, when we were going to the auction, my dad and I had been going just, you know, to kind of see how things worked and, you know, you watch the bidding and you check over the horses and you see what's there and just kind of see how it works and how, how the people bring the horses in and how people are buying the horses and, you know, you can, you eventually learn, okay, who are the big players, who are the dealers, what horses are going to end up going to the number 10 pen and it definitely depends on the economy at that time. I mean, this was back in, uh, maybe it was 2000, maybe it was 2009, I think. Yeah. So, so summer of 2009, we rehomed that horse. And then by fall of 2009, we had been regularly going to the auctions. So this was like when the recession hit in 2008, 
Um, things were very cheap. So horses were very cheap. And people weren't buying. They couldn't really afford to buy horses. So you were getting decent horses dumped at the auction um, because people couldn't afford them. I mean, horses that were trained, horses that were family horses, horses that were camp horses. So your chances of getting a good horse for cheap were actually pretty good. But then again, you have to balance out, okay, well, the economy is kind of crappy right now. Am I going to be able to afford this horse, you know? So that is definitely something to take into consideration. And also getting a horse in the first place is definitely a lot more than just purchasing the horse. It's my mom would always compare it to getting a Barbie doll. You you know, you, you pay for the doll, but then you've got all the accessories and all of the, you know, Barbie doll house and the car and the clothes and all that stuff. Horses can be very, 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 very expensive to keep. And they live for a good amount of time. They can live up to 30 years. So that's something to really take into consideration. Um, I'll obviously discuss that in later podcasts. Um, but it's definitely not like getting a goldfish at the pet store. <laughs> you know, you've got you've got vet bills. You've got to feed them. You've got the farrier. you got to deworm them. you got to, you know, board them somewhere or keep them at your property It's this whole thing. And not to mention, like, if you're going to ride them, you're going to need tack equipment and all that stuff. So it's definitely something to not do lightly. I, you know, I create this podcast because I know there are people out there like I was who are like, yeah, I'll just figure it out. (laughs) You know, I don't really want to go through because I was looking into rescuing at, at one point, I was looking into rescuing from and rescue organization, and that's definitely a very good way to go because they do all the hard work for you. They do all the vetting. They do the training. They do all the hard work for you, and they're the ones who are very good at it. But if this is something that you want to do yourself, I'm definitely here to help out. So I will elaborate more on this story of how I got into it in my part two episode, which I will do next. And then I'm going to just dive into everything that you should consider and the process of how you're going to be training your horse, riding your horse, whatever. Every It's, it's actually very specific. And the more you know, the less heartache you're going to have. You know, you don't just want to buy a 30-year-old horse at the auction and, you know, they have all these health complications and you got to put the horse down. I mean, that's not something that you're going to really enjoy. Um, there's a lot of considerations and it's going to be specific to what you are looking for. Not everyone's looking for a jumping horse. Not everyone's looking for a trail horse. So uh, there will be many episodes to come. I'm very excited about this. And um, if there's ever any topics that you want me to cover, let me know. I believe my email will be in the description of the podcast. I'm not sure. I'm still figuring this out. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to this and I hope you are too. Thank you for joining me on my very first podcast. It's going to be a short one, obviously, but um, they will get longer as I get more used to this and I delve into more topics. I'm going to bring some of my friends in, different connections in the horse world who are more experts on things than I certainly am. Um, because again, I, you know, I went to college for horses and I've had horses for a very, very long time and I've, I've rescued and rehabbed many horses, but I definitely don't know everything. So, um, the more I can equip y'all with the better and I hope you enjoy this. Thank you for listening. Bye. (laughs)